This is a teaching by Pastor Nico Sammons from ICU God Ministries Online. Pastor Nico has started a new series on the book of Nahum. The title of this message is Woe to Nineveh. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we declare that you are a good God and we declare that you are a great King. Thank you that we can study your word today. It is my prayer that your Holy Spirit will open our minds and that he will open our hearts so that we will understand what you want to say to us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. In Jesus' wonderful and powerful name we pray. Amen. The first reason the destruction of Nineveh was deserved was due to the cruelty of the Ninevites. They were known as the dreadful lords of torture and they were infamously cruel. It goes down in history for its violence towards its fellow man. The Assyrians were fierce and bloody and brutal. Nineveh angered God by attacking the image of God in their fellow man. In the ancient world, Assyrian kings like Tiglav Pileser and Shalmaneser, not exactly household names today, were feared by millions of people. They not only committed shameful killings, they bragged of it afterwards. Throughout the ruins of Nineveh, archaeologists have found inscriptions of the brutal boasts of the Assyrian kings. Here is a few examples. Many within the border of my own land I flayed and spread their skins upon the walls. Prisoners were skinned alive and their flesh was used for wallpaper. I cut off their heads and formed them into piles. Three thousand captives I burned with fire. I cut off the limbs of the officers, the royal officers who rebelled. From sons I cut off their hands and their fingers, and from others I cut off their noses, their ears and their fingers. Of many I put out their eyes. I bound their heads to posts round about the city. Assyrian kings also liked to bury their enemies alive inside the walls of their buildings. Defeated kings were led around on dark collars and housed in kennels. Improved interrogation tactics were perfected by Assyria. They were masters of torture. Here is a famous Assyrian practice. A spear was thrust through a man's gut and out of the top of his head. The other end was stuck into the ground. The victim was left to squirm in pain until he died. This was the forerunner for what later developed into crucifixion. And here is what all this means to us today. God cares not only about how we treat him, but how we treat our fellow humans. Every person you come in contact with in the course of a day male or female, young or old, married or single, black or white, born or unborn, handicapped or whole, straight or gay, rich or poor, jailbird or freebird, Christian or Jew or Muslim or Mormon or Hindu. Every human carry in them at some level the image and likeness of God. And for that reason alone, humans are owed a degree of respect. This is why the notion of human rights is distinctively Christian and does not stem from Islam. The Quran refers to Christians and Jews as infidels. Hinduism assigns and enslaves people to a tiered class system. 
Even Judaism treats Gentiles as unclean and outside of God's love. Only Christianity acknowledges a common creator and because we were made in his image, every human is owed certain rights. Nahum 3 verse 1 says, Woe to the bloody city! It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. Sometimes I think we live in a bloody world. Millions of innocent babies die each year. Their only crime being conceived in an uncaring womb. How can there not be blood on somebody's hands? The politician or judge who permits the abortion. The voter who puts that politician into office. The society that does not care for the unwed mother who is in trouble. There is blood on somebody's hands. Bible students, then there is the violence that is occurring in our inner cities. Drugs and gangs and guns create a bloody mixture. Nightly in the big cities of South Africa, someone is killed or hurt in our streets. Our cities could be called the bloody cities. And what about the cycle of domestic abuse that accounts for much of the violence in today's society? Have you ever ignored a situation with a battered friend or an abused child? You should have reported, but it was easier to walk away instead of getting involved. Don't all of us bear at least some of the blame? And what about anger? Anger toward your spouse or your boss or your co-worker. In Matthew 5 verse 21 to 22, Jesus said, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Certainly, the consequences of pulling a revolver and putting a few slugs in a guy is more severe than yelling at him in traffic. But the deed is just a seed allowed to grow. None of us should get arrogant and self-righteous. Don't assume we lack violent tendencies. We might be too law-abiding or lack the nerve to bury a blade in somebody's back. Yet, the same anger can boil in us. Have you ever murdered a boss with cold-blooded gossip? Or stared a hole through a co-worker? Or used violent words against your spouse? How close do you live to the bloody city? One of the reasons God judged the city of Nineveh was that it was all full of lies and robbery. The men of Jerusalem were sitting on the wall of the city when Rabshaki came out with the mighty armies of Assyria, saying, We are going to blow you away. No nation has stopped us. No god of any people has proven a match for our armies. However, if you come out, and make a deal with us, we will let you live in pleasant lands. See 2 Kings chapter 18. This was the Assyrians' typical method of operation. They would make deals with people and lure them out of their cities, only to loot their cities once the inhabitants were defenseless. Nahum 3 verse 2 to 3 says, the noise of a whip, and the noise of the rattling of the wheels, and of the prancing horses, and of the jumping chariots.
The horseman lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there is a multitude of slain, and a great number of carcasses, and there is none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses. God will bring a violent army against Nineveh, but it is not against an innocent city. These people are guilty. Nahum gives us a graphic description of the chariots. They are like armored tanks. They were the tanks of the ancient world. Here is also how he depicts the uproar of the siege, the crack of the whip, the pant of the horses, the screams and moans of suffering, even the crunch of bodies beneath the wheels of invading chariots. And here is why this judgment has come. Nahum 3 verse 4 says, Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts, that salaf nations through her whoredoms, and families through her witchcrafts, here Nahum uses another metaphor. He compares Nineveh to a harlot. She used her military power and the threat of brute force to blackmail the nations around her into worshipping her pantheon of idols. Nineveh was the mafia of the ancient world, with the threat of war, Assyria made the surrounding nations by protection with their worship of their false gods. Carnality was the second reason for Nineveh's destruction. Immorality was a part of it, but the major failing here is actually the idea of witchcraft in both the Old and the New Testament, witchcraft is associated with drugs. The New Testament word translated witchcraft is actually pharmakia, from which we get our word pharmacy. In the taking of the drugs, there is a connection with the supernatural realm of the demonic world. And the Lord says, because you are involved with drugs and witchcraft, and because you have spread your practices throughout the world, I will expose you to the world. Listen, Bible students, any civilization that glorifies drug use will destroy themselves. Nahum 3 verse 5 says, Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness, and the kingdoms thy shame. Here is how the ancient world punished a prostitute. Village leaders lifted her skirt and exposed her nakedness. She was shamefully paraded through downtown. People would come out of their houses and attack her with all kinds of filth. It was a public spectacle. This is how the nations will treat Nineveh and the Assyrians when they fall and are brought to their shame. Nahum 3 verse 6 says, And I will cast abominable filth upon thee, and make thee vile, and will set thee as a gazing stock. And here we should note another contrast. Think of the custom that brought shame on a prostitute. Then the way Jesus treated the women taken in adultery, in John chapter 8 verse 11, the Jews wanted Jesus to condemn her. Instead, he forgave her. He said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Rather than throw filth, Jesus pardoned her and forced the Jews to throw down their rocks. Nahum 3 verse 7 says, 
and it shall come to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee and say Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Whence shall I seek comforters for thee? In other words, God says, where in the world will I get people to come and mourn over this city? Nobody will mourn over it. Nobody will weep over it. That is a very sad situation, a very sad one indeed. God said that there were not going to be any mourners at the funeral of Nineveh. Nahum prophesied that the whole world would rejoice in that day, and they did. When God said this through Nahum, no one would have believed it unless he had believed God and accepted it by faith. But it came to pass, just as God said it would. Nahum 3 verse 8 to 9 says, Art thou better than populous? No. That was situate among the rivers that had the waters round about it, whose rampart was the sea, and her wall was from the sea. Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was infinite. Put and Lubin were thy helpers. Stupidity was the third reason for the destruction of Nineveh. Nahum compares Nineveh with the Egyptian city of No Amon, or better known to us as Thebes. No means the city of, and Ammon was the Egyptian sun god. Thebes was dedicated thus to the sun. The ancient city of Thebes was a magnificent city, remote, wealthy, large, well fortified. It was situated on the Nile, so it had plenty of water and fertile farmland. No one would dream it could be reduced to ruins. Nahum 3 verse 10 says, Yet was she carried away, she went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed in pieces at the top of all the streets, and they cast lots for her honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. The great city of Thebes, however, fell, and suffered greatly, and guess at the hands of who? The Assyrians, the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal, marched through Egypt, setting fire to its villages and crushing the Egyptian army. In 662 BC, he surrounded Thebes and in short order sacked the city. He knew he could not rule over a city so far from his home, so he made an example of Thebes by sentencing its population to slavery and slaughtering its children in the streets. He wanted to scare other Egyptian cities into submission. Who would have thought that the glorious city of Thebes would suffer such a devastating defeat? No one. And that is the point God is making here. Neither would anyone living at the time believe Nineveh could be destroyed. Yet Nahum predicts that God will judge her. Nahum 3 verse 11 says, Thou also shalt be drunken, thou shalt be hit, Thou also shalt seek strength because of the enemy. Drunkenness was the fourth reason for the destruction of Nineveh. This also happened on the Saturday night before the Sunday morning the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Many of the American officers had gotten so drunk the night before and had woken up that morning with a hangover. The historian Diodorus says this is what occurred the night Nineveh fell to the Medes and the Babylonians. The Assyrian officers were as drunk as a skunk. 
Nahum 3 verse 12 says, And thy strongholds shall be like fig trees with the first ripe figs. If they be shaken, they shall even fall into the mouth of the eater. When figs are ripe, all you have to do is just touch a branch and they all would come tumbling down. That is what Nahum says to Nineveh here. You are ripe for the picking. All your defenses are like that. The minute the enemy comes, he is going to break right through them. Nahum 3 verse 13 says, Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are women. The gates of thy land shall be set wide open unto thine enemies. The fire shall devour thy bars. Homosexuality is a fifth reason for the destruction of Nineveh. From historical records, we know that the society of Assyria and the city of Nineveh in particular were caught up not only in homosexuality, but in bizarre, masochistic and sadistic practices. A masochist is a person who derives sexual gratification from being subjected to physical pain or humiliation. A sadist is a person who inflicts physical or psychological pain upon another person for the purpose of achieving sexual excitement. And that is why they were no more able to stand against their enemies than a ripe fig cloud cling to a shaken branch. Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are women. This phrase could also mean an insult. Nahum says the men of Nineveh fight like girls. They are cowards and they are sissies. Nahum 3 verse 14 says, Draw thee waters for the siege, fortify thy strongholds, go into clay and tread the mortar, make strong the bricklin. At the last minute, the Assyrians would get busy making bricks to fortify themselves. They would heat up water which they would carry to the top of the city wall. They would then pour a bucket of the scalding water down upon the soldier who was scaling the wall. He was through scaling the wall, I can assure you of that, and he would soon find himself back on the ground. Nahum now continues on a serious note. Nahum 3 verse 15 says, there shall the fire devour thee, the sword shall cut thee off, it shall eat thee up like the canker worm. Make thyself many as the canker worm, make thyself many as the locusts. Nahum prophesies that they will try to bring in reinforcement, but that they will not help. Nahum 3 verse 16 says, Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spoileth and flieth away. The Assyrian army had roamed the world like a swarm of locust. They looted and robbed the nations and left as quickly as they came with their national treasures. In the same way, the Ninevites boutiques and merchants shops will be leveled in the day of destruction. Nahum 3 verse 17 says, Thy crowned are as the locusts, and thy captains as the great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges in the cold day, but when the sun ariseth they flee away, and their place is not known where they are. At night the cold causes the wings of a locust to grow stiff 
and keeps them grounded. But when the morning sun shines, the heat revives and strengthens the wings of the locust and they become airborne. Nahum 3 verse 18 says, Thy shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. Shepherds are a reference to the Assyrian officials, their leaders. When the going gets tough, Nineveh's leaders are going to run, and they are going to hide. Nahum 3 verse 19 says, There is no healing of thy bruise, thy wound is grievous. All that year the brute of thee shall clap the hands over thee, for upon whom have not thy wickedness passed continually? Recall the old nursery rhyme, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. Nahum is saying that nursery rhyme will soon apply to Nineveh. Great will be her fall. Nahum's prediction goes, however, beyond the fall of Nineveh. He is predicting Assyria would also disappear as a people. The previous verse says, she will be scattered on the mountains and no one will gather them back together. Listen to the following entry in the Cambridge Encyclopedia of Ancient History. The disappearance of the Assyrian people will always remain a unique and striking phenomenon in ancient history. Other similar kingdoms and empires have indeed passed away, but the people lived on. With the Assyrians a nation which had existed 2,000 years and had ruled a wide area, lost its independent character. Historians are baffled by the disappearance of Nineveh and its people, but it is not hard to figure out why. Whenever a person or people love only themselves and care little about how they treat others, God sees to it they end up defeated and forgotten themselves. The historian marvels, but God predicted it in advance. Ultimately, how we treat other people determines how we get treated. Matthew 7 verse 2b says it best. By the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Nahum saw it and God brought it to pass. What are the lessons that we can learn from this Bible study? Number 1. The first two verses of this chapter describes the internal condition of Nineveh. Lies and robbery marked the culture and the climate of the city. This is the reason they acted as they did on the outside toward their enemies, their brutality, their total unconcern for other nations, their lording it over others. The very cause for their methods is that internally they were wrong. You see, Man does not become a sinner because he sins, he sins because he is a sinner. Fundamentally, on the inside man is a sinner, and that accounts for his actions. I am sure that many people in that day said of the Assyrians, these people are uncivilized. Inside the city, it was full of lies and robbery. Unfortunately, lies and robbery also characterizes the internal condition of our nation today. Why? Because we are highly civilized? No, it is because we are sinners. Number two. 
In Matthew 5 verse 21 to 22, Jesus said, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Killing students is a terrible sin, but anger is a great sin too because it also violates God's command to love. Anger in this case refers to a seething, brooding bitterness against someone. It is a dangerous emotion that always threatens to leap out of control, leading to violence and leading to emotional hurt, increased mental stress and spiritual damage. Anger keeps us from developing a spirit pleasing to God. Have you ever been proud that you did not strike out and say what was really on your mind? Self-control is good, but Jesus wants us to practice thought control as well. Jesus said that we will be held accountable even for our attitudes. Number three. Nineveh had used its beauty, prestige, and power to seduce other nations. Like a harlot, she had enticed them into false friendships. Then when the other nations relaxed, thinking Assyria was a friend, Assyria destroyed and plundered them. Beautiful and impressive on the outside, Nineveh was vicious and deceitful on the inside. Beneath attractive facades sometimes lie seduction and death. Don't let an institution, a company, a movement or a person seduce you into lowering your standards or compromising your moral principles. Number 4 In John 8 verse 11 we read, She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Jesus did not condemn the women accused of adultery, but neither did he ignore or condone her sin. He told her to leave her life of sin. Jesus stands ready to forgive any sin in your life, but confession and repentance mean a change of heart. With God's help, we can accept Jesus' forgiveness and stop our wrongdoing. How frequently we make incorrect assessments of others based on appearances of success, wealth, status and power. Nineveh seemed to be invincible. The old adage is true. Don't judge a book by its cover. But her day in God's court came. The great harlot was judged. God's righteousness was restored. And all who cried out, how long, were answered. Payday came and Nineveh was paid in full. Number 5. In Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18, Paul says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Paul contrasts getting drunk with wine, which produces a temporary high, to being filled with the Spirit, which produces lasting joy. Getting drunk with wine is associated with the old way of life and its selfish desires. In Christ we have a better joy, higher and longer lasting, to cure our depression, dullness or tension. We should not be concerned with how much of the Holy Spirit we have, but with how much of us the Holy Spirit has. Submit yourself daily to his leading and draw constantly on his 
power. Number six. God's plan for sexual relationships is His ideal for His creation. Unfortunately, sin distorts the natural use of God's gifts. Sin often means not only denying God, but also denying the way we were made. When people say that any sex act is acceptable as long as nobody gets hurt, they are fooling themselves. In the long run and often in the short run, sexual sin hurts people, individuals, families, whole societies. Because sex is such a powerful and essential part of what it means to be human, it must be treated with great respect. Sexual desires are of such importance that the Bible gives them special attention and counsels more careful restraint and self-control than with any other desire. One of the clearest indicators of a society or person in rebellion against God is the rejection of God's guidelines for the use of sex. Homosexuality, to turn against or abandon natural relations of sex, was as widespread in Nineveh and in Paul's day as it is in ours. God is willing to receive anyone who comes to Him in faith, and Christians should love and accept others no matter what their background. Yet, homosexuality is strictly forbidden in Scripture. Leviticus chapter 18 verse 22 says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Homosexuality is considered an acceptable practice by many in our world today, even by some churches. But society does not set the standard for God's law. Homosexuals believe that their desires are normal and that they have a right to express them. But God does not encourage us to fulfill all our desires, even normal ones. Those desires that violate His laws must be controlled. Number 7. In Matthew 7 verse 1 to 2, Jesus said, Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. The manner in which I judge is the way I will be judged. Is it the manner in which I will be judged by God my Father? No, all my sins have been dealt with on the cross of Calvary. Then who is going to judge me, you ask? People will. If I am critical of others pointing out dirt on their feet with no intention of restoring, helping or healing, I am going to find that same kind of judgment hold at me. In the first chapter of the book of Judges, the men of Judah said, to the men of Simeon. There's a camp of Canaanites over in this valley. Let's go take them on. After beating the Canaanites soundly, the Israelites captured Adonai Bezek, the Canaanite king, and chopped off his thumbs and big toes. Why? Adonai Bezek himself gave the answer when he said, Three score and ten kings, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table. As I have done, so God have requited me. If you chop up someone or cut down someone, watch out. Jesus said the way you judge is the way you will be judged. Number 8. Was the judgment, the doom, the destruction of Nineveh deserved? Yes, for the wrath of God is an important component of His love. 
Because they were doomed already by their corruption and by their disease, God in His love is absolutely justified in destroying such a society. If a snarling dog came into my house, baring its teeth and foaming at the mouth, would I have been justified in judging, in destroying the dog? Yes, because the dog was going to die anyway. He was diseased. He was rabid. He was doomed. But my kids did not have rabies, and I would have had to protect them from the diseased dog. I would not be loving if I said, Oh well, so the dog has rabies. Come on kids, be big hearted. Pet the puppy, give the doggy a kiss. Love means doing what is right and best for the people about whom you care. Thus God looked at the Assyrian society and said, I am giving you year after decade after century to turn to me, but if you refuse, I must destroy you in order to protect the people living round about you. Yes, God is patient, students. He is giving people plenty of opportunity to turn to Him. But the day is coming when He will judge this world radically. I want to conclude Nahum part 3 with this thought. Jesus died on the cross of Calvary to set you free and to give you hope for your future. He will forgive your sins, hand them over to Him. Now is the time to make a decision to follow and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have any questions or would like someone to pray with you, we would be happy to speak with you. Please give us a call at 082-828-2085. We are so excited for your new life in Christ. And there we have the book of Nahum. Be blessed and be safe in Jesus' name. Amen.